There's been much talk over the last few years about homegrown Chinese x86 processors made by companies other than AMD and Intel, the latter of whom owns the x86 license. With some help, we managed to get a full desktop system with one of those Chinese x86 processors. This is the first non-AMD, non-Intel x86 CPU that we've ever reviewed. We'll be reviewing the entire desktop in a separate video, but this one will be focusing solely on the most interesting component, the CPU, which is the Zhaoxin Kaixian ZXC Plus C4701. We checked with our office Chinese Mandarin teacher and the loose translation of Zhaoxin is trillion core or mega core if you prefer, a name which might make AMD jealous for the former or Intel and its mega tasking jealous for the latter. This Shanghai backed company's CPU is an up and coming alternative to AMD and Intel alike. In today's video, the older among you may be shocked to hear names such as Via, Cyrix, and Centaur coming back to relevance. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Raycon Everyday E25 wireless earbuds. We've liked the Raycon Everyday E25s for the relatively long wireless range, something for which we've implemented a strict testing methodology that we've titled the Herculean Phone Toss. The E25s have six hours of playback time and include a socketable pill case with its own battery, so you get packaging that actually serves a functional purpose. The pill case can recharge the earbuds up to an additional 24 hours without needing a cable. The Raycon earbuds also come in multiple colors and include different inserts to help customize for the best fit. They're currently available for 15% off, linked below, or you can visit buyraycon.com slash gamersnexus. So this is the desktop. The desktop is the Chaoxian TZ561-V3. I'm not sure the tones on Chaoxian, so we're gonna go with fried oven. It's sold by Xinhua Tongfan, or THTF, and it has an AMD R7 430, two gigabyte video card, which we had forgotten existed, and it's got eight gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. It has a 256 gigabyte SSD by the extremely well-known brand uh, 4C, very well-known, and it's got a THTF-designed VX11P-CM motherboard, and our prize, the Zhaoxin CPU. So the CPU is a two gigahertz, four core, four thread solution, no SMT on this one, and it is not to be confused with Hygon, which we'll be talking about later, the company that makes the Zen 1 based CPUs in China, but instead something different. We'll be reviewing the whole system again in a separate piece, but for now we're focusing on just the CPU. Just for point of reference, the entire system, this whole box with the side panel, costs 1,000 USD. It's about 7,000 RMB or so, plus or minus a bit. So it's somewhat staggering for the price. You could build a cheaper system with better components in China even. So it's not, this isn't some like West versus East pricing difference. It's just, it's the parts in it that make it expensive. And we'll talk about why with some theories later in this video. So the first thing we did when we got the system was run some benchmarks on it. It's got a custom OS on it that is going to be talked about in the system review, but we installed Windows 10 for on our own SSD for a fairly standard and maybe slightly more controlled environment and ran a couple of tests. Now, the bigger part of this content piece is going to be talking about the history of Zhaoxin, why VIA is involved, how Cyrix is involved, and a couple of the other companies like, like the Hygon CPUs and how they are related as well. It's really interesting history for this one, but we should get the quick benchmarks out of the way first, just to really set the stage on how good this thing isn't. Let's start off with the most successful test. We had the most success with Blender 2.79. We used our standard CPU benchmarking methodology. So you can watch our video from last year, or read the methodology article from last year for that. We used the monkey head and the GN logo renders, which we've designed in house for use as CPU benchmarks. These ran without any issues whatsoever. Well, one, one small issue, the monkey head scene took 306.8 minutes to render. You can take a look at that chart. And the logo scene took a truly impressive 408.9 minutes. This is multiples upon multiples ahead of AMD's 3990X. It's not even close. The Zhaoxin CPU is one of the best CPUs we've had. Oh, hang on, I'm, I'm being told that a bigger bar is actually worse, not better. So it's in minutes, obviously, and higher is worse for something like this. Anyway, we had to leave it running overnight, and that makes it hands down the longest CPU test we've ever had to run to render either of these two images. When we tested the two core four thread Athlon 200GE back in 2018, it took 116.1 minutes to render the monkey heads. 
The old Intel i5-2500K was retested at the end of 2019 into this benchmark, and that one managed 94.2 minutes for the monkey head. The 2500K, as a reminder, is from 2011. It's about nine years old now. For the GN logo render, the Athlon 200GE required 144.9 minutes, the i5-2500K required 121.9 minutes, and the Zhaoxin CPU's 409-minute result marks even the 200GE as needing 65% less time to render. The 200GE and the 2500K are also both overclockable. And as far as we can tell, the ZXC Plus is not, or at least its motherboard didn't allow us, one or the other. We checked, and Blender was definitely using all four cores. It's working properly. It's just that slow. This wasn't a software issue. Cinebench R15 would be the obvious choice for judging relative performance quickly, since we have years of data logged for it, but it refused to launch on the Zhaoxin CPU. R20 proved much more compatible, and the ZXC Plus managed a score of 304 marks, multi-threaded, and 82 in the single-threaded. That multi-threaded score is closer to the single-threaded scores of modern CPUs, and even still below those. It's easy enough to find R20 scores posted publicly online, like on HardwareBot, for example, but just as a frame of reference, the 8-core 16-thread i7-6900K being used to write this script scored 3293 points multi-threaded and 346 single-threaded without closing any tabs or background tasks. We attempted to measure CPU power consumption with the current clamp over the four pin power cable, the one going into the motherboard, EPS 12 volt, assuming that's still the primary CPU power on this new and untested for us platform. The clamp read 0.0, .0 amps when idling at desktop, after being zeroed out and everything else, and a wall meter read just 25 watts for full system power draw idle. It's obviously not possible that it's actually zero amps for the CPU idle, so this platform may be configured to draw some idle power through the 24-pin connector instead. The CPU just, it's not registering on that EPS 12 volt because it's not drawing enough power for our current clamp to measure it. With the logo rendering and the CPU pushed to 100% utilization, the clamp still only read 0.7 amps, 8.4 watts, and the full system wall draw was 51 watts. The CPU heatsink was barely warm to the touch. The entire PC consumed less than a standard light bulb would have a few years ago. We took some additional measurements to be sure. Idle, the 24 pins 12 volt cables measured at 0.4 amps, 4.8 watts. The 5 volt cables, the red ones on the 24 pin, measured at 0.7 amps, or 3.5 watts. And the 3.3 volt cables measured at 0.9 amps, or 2.97 watts. And we used our mod mat to quickly reference the locations of each of these pins. If you want to do the same, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net and order one of the mod mats. We've got large and medium there. So note that these cables also provide power to other devices, the 24 pin, that include the VRM, the fans on the motherboard, or the ones plugged into it, and the GPU via its PCIe slot, so it's not just CPU power. We took these to test versus the Delta when rendering. When rendering the logo, that is, the 24 pin 12 volt line increased between 0.5 amps and 1.2 amps, depending on the scene, for the 5 volt line, it increased by 0.1 amps, and the 3.3 volt cables also increased by 0.1 amps. So we're between 8.4 watts and 18 watts total for the CPU, depending on how much the board is pushing to other things, like the VRM or the memory, and depending on how the board is wired. But it's pretty low power consumption either way. We're a gaming site first, of course, so for this CPU exclusive part of the review, we ran the only game from our suite that should typically be completely non-GPU dependent. That's Civilization VI for its turn time benchmark, which resulted in an average turn time of 183.9 seconds, creating a gigantic bar and blowing out the scale of our chart. Once again, this is the best result we've had. Okay, well, being told that, again, a bigger bar is, in fact, worse for this benchmark. So this is a turn time benchmark. There's five turns in the uh, between the time when you click end turn and your next turn starts. And they average 184 seconds per AI player. Multiply that by five players or more, depending. And that's how long it takes to get to your next turn. So basically, you click end turn, and you should leave the house. And then it'll be your next turn when you come back. This is... One of the, this is the worst that we've ever tested in this benchmark. The previous last place entry in our Civ 6 chart was the $50 2 core 4 thread Athlon 3000G at 72.6 seconds average. 
We allowed the benchmark to run overnight. Again, and to add insult to injury, it had crashed to desktop by the time we came back in spite of successfully completing the benchmark. It just couldn't stay open after all that torture. We can probably stop the performance benchmarking there. You get the idea. We've got comparatives for other CPUs in those charts. So netbook performance and power consumption are what we're looking at for this CPU. And for that, for netbook performance and a CPU installed in a desktop, obviously for $1,000, you start to raise eyebrows at it. We'll cover why anyone would bother in more detail on the system review, but there are several reasons that China is invested in and interested in developing its own homegrown hardware. Massive disclaimer here before we get into the really interesting part of this piece. Uh, we are not here to comment politically or socially on what's going on, nor are we talking about the potential security implications of using these processors. So we're just here to deliver you the factual explanations on why this low-end CPU is of such interest and this low-powered computer hardware exists when China could just as easily buy Intel or AMD processors that are much better and at least retail are cheaper as well. So all we're doing here is breaking it down factually. There's no commentary beyond that. Native Chinese CPUs have been around for years, like Sunway, Fei Tung, Lun Sun, and Zhao Xin. The BLX IC Design Corporation that designs Lun Sun CPUs has been around since 2002 alone. The Lun Sun name is the anglicized version. In Chinese, it's Longxin, and that literally translates to Dragon Chip. It's formerly known as the Godson Chip, if you may have heard of that in the past. Many of these companies are fabulous, working with the existing silicon manufacturers to produce the physical chips. Recently, however, the Chinese government has increased its investment in these companies and the adoption of their products. Over the past decade or so, China's local and central governments have both shown increasing preference for indigenous technology on their procurement lists, culminating in a full-on ban of US software and computers in government offices by 2022. The ban intends to remove hardware from US headquartered companies from government computers in China, and even though a lot of the US branded companies have headquarters in Taiwan, being incorporated in the United States is enough to get the hardware stricken from the options list for China. One reason that China has made this change is America's frequently issued sanctions restricting the sale of technology to China and Chinese companies. In 2015, for example, the US forbade Intel from selling Xeon and Xeon Phi chips to Chinese supercomputer manufacturers. Supercomputers, including most of those in the West, are commonly used for military and nuclear research. So this ban probably isn't surprising. Now to be clear here, there's a line drawn where, as far as we know, for today anyway, and in 2021, AMD and Intel CPUs will still be available on the Chinese market. They're just not supposed to be used for government computers. So that's the limitation. Now presumably where higher performance is needed, they might be using them anyway. But it, that's the line drawn. Consumers will still be able to get AMD and Intel CPUs, at least as of recording today. So AMD and Intel are the only major CPU companies even left these days. There's no one else. They've leveled the playing field. Mostly Intel has leveled the playing field, although it's switched recently. Both of these companies are nominally American. And with more sanctions enacted over the past couple of years, the only remaining choice for China is to obtain its high performance processors and the quantities needed for supercomputers by making them itself. In general, these back and forth sanctions and punishments inhibit technological development and advancement. Likely, this is the intent of those sanctions, but they also have the side effect of encouraging non-AMD and non-Intel competitors to pop up and start making their own CPUs. Necessity here is the mother of invention, as always, and it'll take a long time for Zhao Xin to catch up but it won't take nearly as long as it took Intel and AMD to get where they are today because the hard work's been done. The roadmap has been laid out for new silicon companies. And although a lot of the truly secret parts of the inventions are still undisclosed, AMD and Intel keep tight lips on all of that. It's not really been leaked. It's still going to be a lot easier for new companies to get to where these are today because the groundwork, especially at the fabs, has been laid for them. It's not a scenario where, like AMD and Intel, they were waiting for fabs to catch up for a long time, Intel still, to move to a smaller process. Zhao Xin can kind of start there. So it's, it's not going to have nearly as long of a road. So where this is interesting for the Chinese government is that it wants parts for supercomputers, and it's having trouble getting them because of the sanctions. 
so it's going to make its own. Still, despite sanctions, there's no need to completely start from scratch when designing a new CPU. Some of the Chinese manufacturers just license existing instruction sets, like the MIPS-based Lunsun CPUs, while others are directly based on existing chips, like our Zhaoxing uh, ZXC+, and we'll discuss those in more detail shortly. One of the latter types stands out in particular. The Haigan Diana series, produced by an AMD Chinese joint venture, was recently looked at by Wendell from Level 1 Techs, who's been talking about them in great detail on his channel. In 2016, when the Zen architecture was still pre-release and AMD was searching for ways to claw its way back into profitability, they created the Tianjin Haiguan Advanced Technology Investment Co. Limited, also known as Thatic, which is much easier to say. They also created the Haiguan Microelectronics Company Limited, or HMC, and the Chengdu Haiguan Integrated Circuit Design Company Limited, or Haigan, which takes an entire breath to say. These were made in partnership with various Chinese companies. AMD is the majority owner of Thatic and of HMC, while Thatic is, or was at this point, the majority owner of Haigan. With permission from the United States Departments of Defense and Commerce, as well as, quote, multiple other agencies within the U.S. government, AMD sub-licensed some version of the x86-64 Zen 1 core and its design to HMC. HMC then went back and forth with Haigon to develop a CPU. Haigon ordered CPUs from HMC. HMC placed a production order with Global Foundries, and then they sold the completed silicon on to Haigon, who assembled the finished CPUs and sold them. These layers upon layers of companies made the Haigon CPUs non-American enough, despite working with AMD, that they satisfied the PRC government requirements. That's why that whole mess existed. The end products were essentially identical to first-gen Ryzen and first-gen Epic processors that came out in the first half of 2017, but they were obfuscated in enough of a bureaucratic mess that everyone just sort of shakes their heads, sighs, and says, okay, and then moves on. Anantech and Wendell of Level 1 Tax, again, have looked at the Hygon processors in detail and have write-ups and videos on them if you'd like to learn more about those. But we're looking at Zhaoxing today and a couple of the other parts. The reason we switched in the last section there to past tense, though, was because the joint venture between these companies was effectively killed in 2019. Thatic was explicitly added to the United States entity list, along with Hygon and HMC, meaning that AMD was henceforth forbidden from supplying any intellectual property to those groups, despite having majority ownership of, of, of them. For a legal document, though, it's all surprisingly blunt and very readable to a non-lawyer. It reads, quote, Pursuant to section 744.11b of the EAR, the ERC determined that Chinese entity Sugan and the Wuxi Jiannan Institute of Computing Technology are involved in activities determined to be contrary to the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. Sugan also is, as further described below, the majority owner of Haigan, and Haigan has ownership interests in Chengdu Haiguan Integrated Circuit and Chengdu Haiguan Microelectronics Technology. Accordingly, the ERC has also determined that Haigan, Chengdu Haiguan Integrated Circuit, and Chengdu Haiguan Microelectronics Technology pose a significant risk of being or becoming involved in activities contrary to the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. So this is a lot of the interesting history behind these CPU companies, the various subsidies, the partial ownership AMD has in those subsidies, and how we've gotten to where we are today. A couple of other companies popped up in that quote from the, the foreign entities list, and Sugon is one of them. So Sugon is a supercomputer manufacturer. The U.S. says that, quote, it has publicly acknowledged a variety of military end uses and end users of its high-performance computers. Not really surprising. Pretty much every supercomputer, for the most part, has military uses. And uh, although it's sad, that's just the way that a lot of them are used. Some of them have been turned towards human malware recently, so that at least that's something positive being used for the supercomputers. Now, since the Zen 1 IP that the venture was founded upon was reportedly very high level and did not include detailed RTL information like the recent big Navi leak did, that left the Chinese companies high and dry with limited ability to develop further on AMD's intellectual property. 
AMD retained all of the intellectual property. And unless they left more unsecured notebooks connected to the network, like they did last time, Hygon shouldn't have enough knowledge to, in theory, completely reverse engineer the chips. So, oh, oh also, they're forbidden to do business with global foundries, which is, again, uh, nominally an American company that actually has some fabs in the US and it was in part spun off by AMD when they went fabless. Fortunately for AMD, it had begun securing itself enough of a financial stronghold in the US at this point that the loss of contract wasn't going to put it out of business because that contract, although in 2016, was crucial to hedging against the uncertain future of Zen at the time, it, it was no longer necessary once Zen Plus and Zen 2 came out because They've done extremely well on the market, at least relative to its size, or especially relative to its size. Back to our CPU. Our CPU was created by a less ill-fated joint venture between Via Technologies, that's a name from the past, and the Shanghai Municipal Government, the majority owner. With the sanctions against Thadic, Via is now one of three companies, along with Intel and AMD, that holds an x86 license. Via and TSMC, the fab that Via works with, are Taiwanese companies, so perhaps the US government is less able to control their activities, although this is outside our area of expertise. Zhao Xin has also worked with the Chinese fab HLMC. So yes, this is now a joint venture between a state-owned Chinese company and between a Taiwanese company. We're really lodging ourselves between a rock and a political place, so we'll move along quickly. In 1999, VIA acquired Cyrix, a once promising x86 company run into the ground by National Semiconductor. It also bought Centaur Technologies, an active x86 CPU design house. And remember that the x86 license is gold because only Intel can issue it, just like only AMD can issue the x64 licenses. With the licenses and intellectual property from these acquisitions, VIA has been selling Centaur-based x86 processors for the past two decades with several Eden and Nano models released in 2011. Those were the code names. Releases under the VIA brand name have been rare since, but a server SOC named CHA, or what we're going to call CHA, with an AI coprocessor was announced by Centaur just last year. Unlike Cyrix, Centaur has successfully maintained its identity under its parent company, with the co-founder and lead architect of the AI coprocessor, Glenn Henry, remaining president of the company until his partial retirement in 2019. Via's x86 license is subject to renewal by Intel, which owns the x86 license, and the original 10-year agreement expired in 2013. However, the FTC sued Intel in 2009 for using, quote, anti-competitive tactics to cut off rivals' access to the market and deprive consumers of choice and innovation in the microchips that comprise computers' central processing unit. Most people here remember that happening, especially as it pertained to AMD. This was back when Intel was doing more than just marketing development fund, but was functionally bribing OEMs to use only its parts in place of its competitors' parts. There's a fine line between MDF and uh, illegal anti-competitive practices, and Intel crossed that line. So all of that factors in. In 2010, the FTC approved a settlement that required Intel to, among other things, do the following. Quote, modify its intellectual property agreements with AMD, NVIDIA, and VIA so that those companies have more freedom to consider mergers or joint ventures with other companies without the threat of being sued by Intel for patent infringement. Further quotes, offer to extend VIA's x86 licensing agreement for five years beyond the current agreement, which expires in 2013. The first half of this requirement might explain why Shanghai Jiaoxin Semiconductor Co. Limited came into existence, the joint venture, and why it was founded precisely in 2013. CPUs based on VIA and Centaur's Isaiah architecture have also been released primarily under that brand since then. So we've been using the term x86 here to talk about licensing. But to be absolutely clear, Jiaoxin CPUs are 64-bit x86-64 chips. Their first two CPUs were the ZX-A and the ZX-B, which were both based on the Nano X2 CPU from 2011. The Nano X2 CPU is two Nano 3000 CPUs from 2009 that were stuck on one die. The ZX-C is based on the Eden X4. While Hardware Info, the software, reports our ZX-C Plus 
as being a nano quad-core C4650. The ZXC Plus is produced in both four-core, that's the Kaishan and eight-core, or Kaishan variants, and no Jiaoxin CPUs have SMT, just to be clear on that. So it's four and eight, period. The eight-core consists of two dies linked via FSB, which might start to sound a little bit familiar. Somehow, Jiaoxin's naming conventions up to this point are a little less confusing than the underlying via CPUs. But after the ZXC Plus, Jiaoxin began transferring to a different naming scheme. The ZXD, or KX5000, has the same basic specs as the ZXC Plus, but it's a single die SOC design with an integrated Northbridge and DDR4 support, courtesy of a new Wudaoko microarchitecture, which is supposedly the first major divergence from the Centaur Isaiah base. For what it's worth, Wudaoko roughly translates to five roads intersection. It's named after a train station. Regardless of how much development assistance does or doesn't come from Centaur, there are real advances being made under the Jiaoxin brand without just copy pasting older CPUs. The ZXE or KX6000 was a more dramatic performance upgrade, moving to a 16 nanometer process and a three gigahertz clock speed on the uh, Lu Jiaozui architecture. And to clarify, ZXC or KX5000, et cetera, are families of CPUs with multiple SKUs in between them and different configurations of core counts and frequencies for each, just like others. Wikichip is the most fruitful English language source of information on any of these CPUs. They've had direct contact with Jiaoxin and Centaur, and both of those companies seem pretty open. So if you want to learn more of the history, check out Wikichip. Our system came with a discrete GPU though, but one other selling point of the ZX processors is that they're equipped with integrated graphics. That's done through the chipset on our ZXC Plus. But later CPUs like the ZX5000 actually include an on-die GPU or an IGP. There are unsubstantiated reports that this architecture is based on IP from the S3 graphics solution. Many sources on Xin CPUs cite the same Pharonix forum post by user the underscore SCX which contains a huge volume of very confidently stated and highly specific information about Jiaoxin, uh, S3, HTC, Via, Centaur, and hardware. It's worth a read, but we can't personally vouch for it. S3 was founded in 1989. It floundered in the late 90s, and that was with the rise of 3D accelerators. It then spun off its graphics division and sold it to Via, actually, in 2000, where they developed chipset IGPs until 2011, and they sold them to HTC. According to the ZX6000 spec sheet, the integrated graphics support is up to 4K resolution and DirectX 11. So again, catching up and quickly. We have our doubts about some of the claims that the company has made. They claim that they're going to achieve parity with Ryzen in 2020, Ryzen 1. Given where we saw the performance in these benchmarks, that seems actually impossible, but we'll see. That's supposed to be this year. There are also claims of releasing seven nanometer parts in 2021, which we also sort of doubt. But none, about, none of the doubt here is in the fact that Jiaoxin's making big strides. It's just they're not that big. So this ragtag assembly of old intellectual property has turned into a series of processors that is, at very best, a functional Windows compatible alternative to AMD and Intel CPUs. It's not something we'd recommend buying, even if you're in China, because you can buy AMD and Intel parts for cheaper that are better. This whole system, even if you built it, you go to Huachan Bay SEG e market or something, which is not, I mean, you buy on Taobao or something too, but you get it done cheaper with other parts. So the real reason this exists seems to be that it's a, a municipal or state-backed venture to create CPUs for China's future supercomputers. That's kind of our guess based on a lot of research. Subscribe for more. Please let us know what you think of this type of content. There's a lot of information here that kind of bleeds between technology and global politics. We try to stay away from the latter and give you more of the former, but obviously it's, you can't completely separate them given the topic. So let us know. We like this type of content. It's long form research and journalism. If you want to fund this type of effort because it's very expensive for the time cost to do it all, you can help us out on patreon.com slash gamersnexus, or you can get something in exchange for your support on store.gamersnexus.net. And uh, that'll help me keep Patrick funded to continue 
laboriously researching these types of topics because he did all the research on this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.